The Full Melt Show is intended for a mature audience. It contains adult themes, adult content, and sometimes adult language. Listener discretion is advised. It's the Full Melt Show. Sunday morning, LAPD officers responded to a call of a body at the home in the 11,100 block of Runnymede Street. Along with the man's body that investigators believe had been there for days, police say they also discovered a marijuana growing operation. During the clearance of the house also, we found in the back of the garage, uh, a marijuana grow. Sunday evening, the LA County Coroner's Office removed the refrigerator with the body inside to take back to the crime lab as investigators interviewed four people who lived nearby. I heard an argument on, I guess it was Friday night, but I really didn't think anything of it. For 22 years, nothing like this has happened before. According to several longtime residents, the people who lived in the home recently moved in several months ago. Neighbors say they had no idea of any illegal activity. I didn't realize it was a grow house. I didn't realize any of this. You know, I mean, they seemed nice enough. I would just say hello. Police taped off the house, Jaguar, and Bentley and seized several large garbage bags of marijuana plants. And also some of the balises and Land, lamps that were taken from the uh, marijuana grow and also the marijuana. The gruesome discovery of the body leaves some in fear. You don't know who's going to come to live uh, near to your house, you know, because it's like they don't know nothing. It's people over there, but you don't know who's your neighbor. And tonight, tow trucks took away at least three cars parked at the home. Police say one man lived there, but residents say they thought several men lived in that house. Are you high? What are you talking about? This is the full melt show. Give me a The full melt show. A marijuana discussion about news, culture, politics, and lifestyle. Fullmelt.com. Toll free. 844-420-TALK. 844-420-TALK. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Live from the PetPain.com studios in suburban Detroit, I'm Steve Green, and this is The Full Melt Show. Working on the cannabis news of the day. What's going on in the world of cannabis? I shall hence ye forth speak it. It is not against my religion. I will not prevent the issuance of documents certifying you as a cannabis user. What's up with that Kim Davis chick? I mean, uh, somebody who's so twisted up over the ideal that her religion may get in the way of a secular job. It just, uh, uh, I want to plug my ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. Uh, such ignorance in America. I'm sorry. Look, I love uh, the, the people of, of faith in this country. Um, I appreciate them. I respect them for who they are and what they believe. But you can't be crossing church and government. It's just something that doesn't belong in this country. Look, if you want to, you know, let the government rule by by religious edict, go join the Taliban. Go off to Iran where you get to have that kind of an environment. Um, it, it's not going to happen here in this country where it's not going to be allowed. It, it's not constitutional. Get over it. There's no war on Christianity, no, just like there's no war on the, the Muslim faith. Uh, this is all a bunch of naysaying. Uh, red herring, BS crybaby whining uh, over uh, fundamentalist ideas. Um, I'm sorry, but this is this is the world we live in. In this country, you don't get to decide those kinds of issues. It's not your religion. It doesn't get to work that way. You don't get to disregard man's law because you've got God's law. If you want to operate within God's law, you can do that under the guise of man's law. That's how everybody does it in this country. Like I said, if you want to use it the other way around, if you want to flip-flop those two principles, there are places where you can have that and all the crap that comes with it. You're welcome to uh, enjoy uh, that laissez-faire. So <clears throat> this uh, ideal that you might find a body at the opening of the show there. <laughs> I mean, good Lord, what have people come to? And I told you, you know, when there's bad news about marijuana, and I see one of these in the in the news every day, there's always somebody that was busted with a couple of pounds or, you know, several pounds or, you know, a couple of kilos or some guy's grow got busted or there was some operation that got taken down in a, in a forest somewhere. Uh, 
there are a lot of these stories. Um, not all of them include a body. Um, in fact, I would say that it's this is the absolute, probably, if, if I was to uh, cast a, a, a shadow or, or, or some limelight on a, a marijuana news item, that this would be the last thing I would choose to do because it kind of plays into the stereotype that marijuana bad. Um, there are bad things that happen all over the place. This is an instance. Uh, there was a, a, a house in California in, in, in the Palo Alto area where a body was discovered in a freezer, uh, one of those, you know, chest freezers. It was outside the residence. Uh, people had recently moved into there, and obviously at some point the garage area, it was a detached garage, uh, was converted into a marijuana grow operation. <laughs> so it wasn't actually a grow house. It was more of a grow garage, so to speak. And something led police to the body in the freezer. And upon investigation of that, you know, apparent homicide, because, you know, you don't get in a freezer and just die. And something happened to the guy or girl. There was a body. We don't know any details about said body. But we do know um, that marijuana was found on the location. And so, you know, this is going to be classified by the people who put the documentation together about this homicide as a marijuana-related homicide. As if, you know, the pot had anything to do with it. It might as well be a driveway-related homicide because that's where the body was found. But you're not going to find it classified that way. It might be a suburban-related homicide. Not going to find it classified that way either. Because it was found with marijuana, they're going to classify it as a marijuana-related homicide. Now, now, you know, the marijuana may or may not have anything to do with the death of this individual. People will glean from it what they will, but the facts will be laid out in the future, won't they? When, when the details come out about that murder investigation and the associated uh, drug grow. But as a policy issue in this country... Uh, mar- marijuana in California seems to be making some headway. The legislature has finally gotten together and put together some ideals after pussyfooting and dragging their feet for some 20-odd years, nearly. I think it was 96. So we're going on 2016 since medical marijuana was legalized in California. There have been a couple of bites at legalization outright, wholesale. Failed. Uh, the, the, the community splintered into a bunch of people who wanted to say, oh, no, but we want to do it this way, or we want to do it that way, or we want to do it like alcohol, or we know we don't want to do it like alcohol, we want to do it like tomatoes. <clears throat> the arguments ensued. The community splintered. Uh, their efforts went into different resources and places. They couldn't get, gather together the coalition necessary to get this passed, given any vocal opposition and paid advertising uh, trying to uh, defeat you. And so... The legislature has finally started to react. You know why? Because much of this has been pressured from so many angles, they had no choice but to react, but to make some legislation, but to pull up their britches and do their damn jobs, which is to legislate the will of the people who obviously are in favor of this kind of treatment with cannabis, Uh, both from a commercial standpoint to adults uh, of legal age and older, uh, for whatever use they so choose, and also to uh, patients in the medical system. And there are a lot of them. California is a big state. I mean, it nearly trims down one side of the whole country, save Oregon and Washington State. It's a huge populace. And it is just as divided as it is vast. You know, you've got the conservative areas in Oakland, Berkeley, and other communities of affluence. And then you've got the people that are, uh, you know, just outright hippies. It seems like, and I was uh, watching some, there's going to, I think there's a, is there a documentary special on this? I think there is. HBO is doing something about it. They're talking about the conversion of San Francisco, which would probably be the most liberal area in the whole nation, one would think. You know, in San Francisco... Uh, you know, uh, you can be naked in a park bench and nobody gives a crap. 
nobody's hauling you off to sex prison because they think you're committing. Com- they'll sit right down next to you in the restaurant, stark naked, with a newspaper and drinking a coffee. And nobody says boo. Uh, do that in Alabama, and you're liable to leave the prison with no nutsack. Um, or, or, you know, you're going to be whatever. The punishment is severe. In, in California, the, the variance of people's taste and political affiliation, like I said, is as vast as the country, as the state is wide or long. And so you're going to see this conversion by by affluence, uh, young affluence mostly in in San Francisco, where the price to live, the cost of living, is so high, because all this tech money is moving in, and it's pushing out what made San Francisco attractive in the first place from its diversity standpoint. I mean, you got hate at hate Ashbury. Boy, I tried to combine that into one word. You got the hate Ashbury district. You know, uh, ground zero for tune in, uh, tune out, dr- uh, tune out, dr- was it dro- tune in, drop out, uh, whatever. The whole LSD thing in the 60s, uh, I couldn't get that straight I could, for whatever reason. <laughs> and then you've got, uh, you know, you've got the birth of acid rock and, and you know, Jimi Hendrix and all this stuff coming up out of Haight-Ashbury in the 60s uh, that, that gave room for all of this, you know, liberal ideology. Um, and 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 the diversity that is under that umbrella is immense. And so that coloration of the city is quickly being changed as this capital investment comes in from tech town and changes things everywhere. And so you've got what would be the most liberal area in the state now kind of converting and pushing out the liberals into the outlying communities, uh, making the affluence a conservative one. And in the downtown district, like I said, it's completely coloring the city a different color. Uh, from you know, Not from a racial standpoint, not from a skin tone standpoint, but from a social standpoint. Uh, the map is changing. And so that's an interesting feature. But in California, you would think... Uh, that at some point before now, they'd have gotten their crap together and ironed out some legislation uh, to carve out some uh, official stance from the state government about this uh, legalization proposition that they passed in 96 about medical marijuana. They led the nation on this industry. 20 years later, they're finally starting to do something. We'll talk about Florida and other states like Massachusetts next. You're getting the full melt. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit Canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology. Hey, it's Steve Green for the Sweet Leaf in Flint because now getting safe access to medical cannabis patients in Flint, Michigan is never more welcoming. Presenting the Sweet Leaf, a brand new patient experience bringing 12 carefully selected caregivers housed in nine separate offices to distinctly assist you with their knowledge and reputation for excellent patient care. Classes and training coming soon in the large community room. Check it out in person, 400 South Door Highway or call 810 259 25 The Sweet Leaf Center in Flint, 810-259-2571. Introducing Sacred Elements, a place for natural and alternative healing for the mind, body, and soul. Sacred Elements. It's one place. All solutions. Registered, licensed, certified, ordained. Sacred Elements. Massage, hypnosis, Reiki. Sacred Elements. Raindrop, aroma and color therapy. Body detox. Ministry, life coaching, weight and nutrition counseling. Sacred Elements. Next to the Sweet Leaf, 400 South Door Highway, Flint. 11 to 7 daily, closed Sunday. Call 810-259-2570. Young students are our future. They're eager to learn. Eager to succeed. Eager to make the world a better place. And they want to make it to school safely. Share the road. Take care when passing. And always leave three feet between you and people on bikes. Bikes are legal road vehicles. 
We're all drivers. Don't miss the first ever cannabis competition this year as the prize contest moves from Amsterdam to Jamaica. That's right, it's all Jamaican fun now with the big cup competition in Negril this November. Get your best travel accommodations now at jamaicapot.com. Pack your beach bong and swimsuit and party down at the warm sunny beaches of Negril, Jamaica for the first ever big cannabis event this year. Do it in style or come have fun on a budget. Best travel prices now at jamaicapot.com. That's jamaicapot.com. What's up with these things, Victor? We decided to give ourselves stickers for each feature we release. We read about 10,000 suggestions a week to create features that, as traders, we'd want to use. 10,000 suggestions? Who reads all of those? He does. For all the confidence you need, TD Ameritrade, you got this. It's the Bull Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. <laughs> Find us here Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 until 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the fullmelt.com. Really easy to uh, link to us on iTunes and get the show every day right there in your mobile device. Uh, the link's on the front page of the fullmelt.com. Click and subscribe. Just that simple. Listen, some news today out of Massachusetts. I have to tell you that the story has arisen again about an individual who claims to have been fired for their off-site cannabis use. In other words, uh, what they did at home. Not what they did at work, or what they did at home. And this is a, a medical marijuana state, Massachusetts is. Uh, this story today out of MassLive.com. Uh, Dateline Boston. When Christina, Bur- uh, I think it's Barbudo of Brewster, took a job with a marketing firm, she told the company that she used medical marijuana to treat symptoms of Crohn's disease. Barbudo says she worked for only one day for Advantage Sales and Marketing, promoting products in a supermarket, and then the company fired her. The reason they gave was that Barbudo failed a required drug test by testing positive for marijuana. When she complained, she said a human resources representative told Barbudo that the company, which has offices nationwide and in Massachusetts, follows federal, not state law. Barbudo's claims were laid out in a complaint she filed in Suffolk County Superior Court accusing Advantage Sales and Marketing of discrimination and invasion of privacy. Barbudo's case is the first of its kind in Massachusetts, but her circumstances are not unique. Massachusetts's fledgling medical marijuana law is largely silent on an employer's responsibility towards an employee who uses medical marijuana after hours. As medical marijuana dispensaries begin to open and more Massachusetts residents start to use medical marijuana, experts say the question will have to be decided either by the courts or by the legislature. Current medical marijuana law and regulations do not address the issue of employment discrimination, says Nicole Snow, executive director of the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance, which represents medical marijuana patients. She says, quote, patients have a false sense of security that they're going to be protected by the medical cannabis law. No one realizes that there are no explicit protections in the law. Massachusetts's medical marijuana law explicitly says that employers do not have to accommodate marijuana use in the workplace, but it says nothing about whether employers can forbid medical marijuana use outside the workplace. Barbudo's lawyers are seizing on a provision in the law that says a medical marijuana user cannot be penalized under Massachusetts law or, quote, denied any right or privilege, end quote, because of using medical marijuana. They use Massachusetts's anti-discrimination and privacy laws to argue that the marketing firm discriminated against Barbuda because of her disability and because she treated it with medical marijuana. Even though federal law forbids marijuana use, Barbuda's lawyers say there's no federal law preventing a company from hiring someone who uses marijuana. Barbuda's attorney, Matthew Fogelman, a Newton lawyer specializing in employment law, said Barbuda is able to manage her case of Crohn's disease, which causes inflammation of the digestive tract, uh, digestive tract and perform her job with proper treatment, including the use of medical marijuana at home. <clears throat> Quote, we believe the company discriminated against Miss Barbudo due to her medical condition and refused to provide a reasonable accommodation to her, which is the use of medical marijuana to treat her medical condition, Fogelman said. Fogelman said Barbudo has a certificate from her doctor under state law. He said she is lawfully entitled to use marijuana for medicinal purposes to treat her medical condition and improve her life. 
Barbudo is also represented by Adam Fine, a Boston lawyer who has tried medical marijuana cases around the country and is active in the campaign to legalize recreational marijuana in Massachusetts. A spokesman for Advantage Sales and Marketing did not return calls. Barbudo's case is the first to go to court in Massachusetts, but she's not alone. Templeton resident Stephen Drury told the Republican or MassLive.com before a state house hearing in July that he's a union carpenter who's not worked since 2010 because he takes medical marijuana to treat ulcerative colitis and his union requires a drug test. The union won't allow me to work because I have THC in my blood, Drury said. Chris Gehern, a spokesman for Associated Industries of Massachusetts, a trade industry group, says employers are concerned about medical marijuana use as well. It's an issue we hear about on a regular basis from employers who are trying to balance workplace safety with the challenging laws surrounding medical marijuana use, says Gehern. Tamson Kaplan, an employment lawyer at Davis, Malm, and D- uh, Dagestein in Boston, said she is often asked by the employers she represents how to deal with medical marijuana use outside the workplace. Quote, it's a huge issue, Kaplan said, end quote. Kaplan said while the medical marijuana law does not address it, she looks at privacy and discrimination law and advises clients that they can require drug tests if there's an issue of safety, for example, for a forklift driver. But if there's no safety issue, she tells clients to judge an employee by their performance at work. I have to advise clients to carefully balance legitimate business interests that are at stake against the privacy interests of the employee, Kaplan said. Kaplan said judges in other states, including California, Montana, and Washington, have generally found in favor of employers, ruling that they can fire employees for using medical marijuana. But for those cases uh, are not binding. Uh, on the Massachusetts court, and each state medical marijuana law has different wording, so a Massachusetts judge could potentially rule otherwise. Anyone working for the federal government or subject to federal regulations, like truck drivers, may be subjected to drug tests and cannot use marijuana due to the federal law. The confusion has led to calls to change in state law. State Representative Frank Simzik, a Democrat from Brookline, has sponsored a bill that would bar employment discrimination against medical marijuana users, prohibiting companies from using a worker's status as a medical marijuana patient against them in hiring or firing. Currently, medical marijuana patients have to worry not only about their medical issues, but whether their current or future employment is in jeopardy, Smithick said. As a state, we have chosen to recognize the benefits of medical marijuana, and this choice comes with the responsibility of ensuring that patients can access their medicine without the fear of losing their livelihoods. <clears throat> state Senator John Keehan, a Democrat from Quincy, an opponent of the medical marijuana legislation who's called, who has called for a tightening of the state's medical marijuana laws, says he thinks employer-employee relations will increasingly become problematic as more people start using medical marijuana. For example, he said a company might have one employee using medical marijuana for a legitimate medical purpose and another who has a medical marijuana certification but is using the drug recreationally. How does an employer differentiate between those and uh, should there be a need for an employer to differentiate at all, Keenan said. I think it will increasingly be an issue and I think it begs for regulation. So there may be some different outcome i can say you know and the story cites uh, past court cases in other states that are not binding to massachusetts law as again the story pointed out um are, are you know are looming questions uh, it's not just massachusetts that's going through this michigan's decided on this issue um you know and there's these other states but can can we look forward to a different argument to be held by courts there in Massachusetts, another liberal wing of the country. I mean, this is uh, the birthplace of of Senator Ted Kennedy. I mean, Ted Kennedy was responsible for helping get Social Security law passed. That's how long he was in Congress. Um, And, you know, other uh, liberal Democrats have come out of the Massachusetts area. Do you think... There may be, given the voting history of Massachusetts uh, voters, uh, that um, there might be a different judge with a different opinion, given the right argument made. Uh, Only time will tell. (laughs) I would think that it's common sense, isn't it? Uh, these These are really common sense questions, aren't they? I mean, it's common sense that you don't drive while impaired. The question is, what is impaired? 
I think that measure can be made individually, case by case. Courts and cops and judges don't like to make those choices individually because they've got to prove every single one beyond a reasonable doubt. It's much easier if the legislature passes per se uh, limitations in blood. They did it with alcohol for this very same reason. Um, Now they're trying to do it with THC. The difference between alcohol and THC, you have to understand, is vast and wide. First off, alcohol is a single chain molecule. It's a very simple molecule. It responds and reacts to everybody exactly the same way. It's a measurable thing. You can put it in one's body and measure its impact by ounce and weight of the individual involved. Uh, The line is the same with everybody. This amount of intoxication, this amount of registration on the blood alcohol uh, meter um, is, is, is intoxicated. We're going to call this level intoxicated. I don't agree with it. I think uh, the old-fashioned hand-to-nose thing, uh, doing, you know, doing all the sobriety checklist stuff. If you can perform all the sobriety checklist stuff, I don't care what you're on, you should be fine to drive. I mean, this is the question. That's why they have these roadside sobriety checks. Uh, if they're going to pull you out because they think you're impaired by something, they need a, a way to measure this impairment. And, and I don't think necessarily that a number on a scale is the way to go, especially with marijuana, because unlike alcohol, it's a three-chain molecule. It's the T, the H, and the C. This is just alcohol, on the other hand. It's just the one, the one alcohol molecule. It's just by itself. <clears throat> a three-chain molecule reacts in different people different ways. Not to mention this tolerance level. Um, I've seen people and, and known people to have extremely high amounts of, of THC metabolite in their blood, especially, and, and drive fine. Um, there are also people who can have active THC in their blood and have a tolerance which doesn't affect any impairment scale on their body. So you end up, or if there is a, a, a slight impairment, if there's, if there's some noticeable detectable amount of impairment, it certainly isn't inhibiting their ability to drive. And again, I, I, just, I, I, I posit that these are all individual challenges, that if you're going to accuse somebody of a crime, especially uh, the crime of operating a vehicle while you're intoxicated under any circumstance, no matter what the intoxication source claimed to be alleged in play, that the measure of intoxication should be based on performance, not based on a number. Can you imagine if you, uh, uh, you know, went to your job and you tested well in a test, but you were just a shitty employee? Oh, you were just the crappiest employee ever. You knew all the stuff, but you just couldn't hold it together. You couldn't show up on time. You couldn't do your stuff. Can you imagine if they paid the employee based on the test and not based on his performance? You would never see that stand in a workplace. Because performance means everything. In fact, you might store, score crappily on a test, but do well in performance of your job title and duties. And any, perfor- any employer's measure of success is his employee's ability to carry out their job in the way it's described, in the way it was prescribed, in the way that you've been mandated by your employer. And if you can do that task, and, and you do it well, regardless of any test that you took, um, you're going to stay in gainful employment with that employer, most likely. Um, this is not the same situation when you're talking about driving abilities and tests. If you're out there and you conduct a roadside sobriety test and you pass all that sobriety check, and then somebody gives you a breathalyzer and you score over on the breathalyzer. You see, you had no, no problems with motor skills, no problems with speak, speaking, your speech wasn't slurred, you could say your ABCs, you could do the one, two, threes, you could do the stuff backwards. Uh, You walked the line. You didn't fall over. There was no bobbling. You held your leg up. You tilted your head back. You passed all the sobriety stuff. But somebody meters you out, and they say, oh, you're intoxicated. We're going to have to haul you off because you can't drive a car. I just basically demonstrated to you that I clearly can. This is the divergence we have with reality versus what prosecutors and judges want in a courtroom environment. And so when, when you look at these instances and applications as they come on new state by state and they do and some of this will be hashed out in advance some of them will already have per se limits in order to accomplish medical marijuana laws or in order to get legalization done on a broader scale Uh, but but chances are they will not be tied to performance they're likely to be tied to per se nanogram limits in your in your blood 
And, and what that means is that it, regardless of your uh, uh, impairment, regardless of your ability to perform behind the, the wheel, that you're going to be scrutinized, you're going to be measured, and you're going to be prosecuted if you have any of these levels beyond that per se limit in your blood at the time you were pulled over as evidenced by any blood draw done by a police officer. And in, in, in those circumstances vary in different states as well. You know, some states you can't do a blood draw unless you fail the sobriety check. You know, because there's no there's no breath test for marijuana, albeit there's uh, several uh, companies, uh, you know, trialing several products right now, claiming to be able to see active marijuana in one's breath sample. Uh, whether they're accurate or not is, uh, remains to be seen. None of them have been released to the market. Moving on to Florida, you know, there's. The same thing you got going on in Florida as you got kind of going on in California, except you've got a slightly more elderly crowd. Uh, the people in Florida have very diverse opinions and points of view as well. And seasonally, the population shifts. It changes. People move in. They, people move out. People, some people have residences there. Some just summer homes. Some can vote there. Some cannot vote there. It's various and sundry place, and the populace is split, especially in the southern part of the of the state, uh, by uh, other, you know, barriers. There are speech barriers with the Hispanic and Latino community, and also cultural barriers. I would say that Florida, I, I, you know, I've never I've never been out to California, so I can't speak to the southwest of the country. Outside, I think the furthest west I've been is Denver, if I'm not mistaken. Denver's west of Texas. That's the furthest west I've been in my whole life. Never got a chance to go to California. So I like I can't talk about California. But I can tell you that the cultural diversity in South Florida brings a palette of taste uh, that you would uh, never have in the Midwest or in the South even, just in the regular South. <clears throat> more, of it's, more of it's cropping in. And Donald Trump, you know, Donald Trump would have you throw those bastards out. Oh, go back across the border. Uh, we're going to uh, hire a bunch of federal workers to sh- round you up and ship you across the border. And then you can go over there and help build a fence and pay for it. And then uh, when you come back and get in line legally, maybe we'll think about letting you in and picking some tomatoes here or maybe watching the kids or you know, being a nanny or whatever it is that we might want to make you do that we don't want to do. <laughs> You're getting the full melt. Get ready, let's go. Hey, na 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 Oh, hey, na hey, na let's go. Yeah, I've got style. latest styles to mix it and mash it so make it your own and bend the trend jc penny when it fits you feel it during the jc penny back to school hot sale get an extra ten dollars off when you spend 25 or more with coupon nike converse levi's and other exclusions apply what's up with these things victor we decided to give ourselves stickers for each feature we release we read about ten thousand suggestions a week to create features that as traders we'd want to use ten thousand suggestions who reads all of those he does. For all the confidence you need, TD Ameritrade, you got this. Don't miss the first ever cannabis competition this year as the prize contest move from Amsterdam to Jamaica. That's right, it's all Jamaican fun now with the big cup competition in Negril this November. Get your best travel accommodations now at jamaicapot.com. Pack your beach bong and swimsuit and party down at the warm sandy beaches of Negril, Jamaica for the first ever big cannabis event this year. Do it in style or come have fun on a budget. Best travel prices now at jamaicapot.com. That's jamaicapot.com. If you're like us, your pets aren't just animals. They're members of your family. Pet Pain CBD Hemp Oil Drops are great for aging as well as active dogs and cats. Some people are apprehensive about hemp treatments for pets. They ask us, what are you smoking? Absolutely nothing, and neither will your pet. Like other hemp-based products for humans, the allure is all of the benefits of cannabis without any of the high. The CBD oil has shown to rejuvenate the bones, joints, brain, stomach, eyes, and heart. And the drops contain absolutely no corn, wheat, soy, artificial colors and flavors, or preservatives. Pick some up today. Visit PetPain.com. 
or ask for Pet Pain at your local pet store. PetPain.com. CBD relief for your pet. We ask people to tell us something that happened in their past and something that might happen in their future. The good things were put on yellow magnets and the bad ones on blue. The results show the past was a pretty even mix of good and bad, yet the future was almost all good things. Now that you've seen the results of this experiment, what does it mean to you? We all want to think about positive stuff. Realistically, there will be downtimes. It's great to think optimistically, but let's plan for whatever the future might bring. Prudential, bring your challenges. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. You want to call or chime in on a subject anytime on the radio show, guest or otherwise, we make that available to you toll free. You can call 844-420-TALK. It's a toll free number, 844-420-TALK. They are the no smell Canalock.com phone lines. Let's talk about Florida. You know, the Florida Cannabis Act would legalize marijuana in the state. Michael McNardi on a mission to make recreational marijuana legal in Florida next year. Asked how he would do that, considering that a ballot measure to legalize just medical marijuana didn't pass in 2014. He says, quote, we're going to use science and we're going to use stats. Minority is a West Palm Beach attorney who in March won a landmark case that successfully used medical necessity as a defense for pot charges against his client. He is teamed with a fellow attorney, Bill Wolfeser, and marijuana activist Karen Goldstein to, re- form the co- uh, to form a corporation called Sensible Florida and an associated group Regulate Florida. Together, they developed a proposed amendment to the state constitution that would legalize and regulate recreational marijuana for adults. The Florida Cannabis Act proposes legalizing pot and regulating it like alcohol. It would allow anyone 21 or older to purchase and possess up to an ounce of marijuana and, if licensed, grow up to six plants at home. Can you imagine that? Uh, It seems like uh, the sensible Florida people have come to their senses and used some of the crafted language so diligently worked upon in other states to do these very same things and take the best of those issues, the most popular of them, and craft their own ballot language. And good for you. Watch out for Sheldon Adelson. He's going to come at your heels. If, if history is any representation of the future. Uh, Sheldon devoting some $5 million of his own personal liquor and casino gaming funds towards defeating, by a mere margin of two percentage points, and I think it was a two-thirds majority of uh, people had to vote for that uh, law when it failed uh, last time around. So that $5 million had some impact. It got some old people to the the voting booth uh, to pull that lever for the prohibitionist crowd. And it's going to happen again if people don't rally together and support uh, this attorney and his efforts uh, to regulate marijuana in Florida. For adults, this isn't for kids. If you want to keep it from kids, you regulate it. You don't turn it into a black market. Black market, just you might as well just open the door. You might as well just put the pot right in the kid's back pocket. Just put it in there and just tell them, look, there's some pot in your back pocket. I'm going to tell you you shouldn't use it. You're probably going to try it anyways. You might as well just put it right in there for them. Uh, Some parents choose to do this regardless of the law, uh, regardless of... And and the reasoning behind it is, I would say... uh, What's the best term I'm looking for here? It's noble. Uh, the, The reasoning behind their thought process is a noble one. That I would rather have my kid uh, trying and using uh, the cannabis in my house under my controlled, supervised, you know, parentage uh, than turning them free to the neighbors who might have other substances that I may disapprove of entirely and also other activity that may be criminal and loop my kid into the system. It's a legitimate fear. But again, all of that other fear goes away if you if you take control of the issue rather than prohibiting it and turning it into a black market where it's just right next door anyway. 
<clears throat> this is finally getting through to the populace at large. People at large are finally beginning to understand that drug dealers don't card students. They don't card kids running around looking to get high. You know who does? The guy that's selling booze at the liquor store because he doesn't want a ticket and doesn't want to go to jail, and the liquor store doesn't want to lose their license. You see, there are stakes at play that people don't want to pay for. <clears throat> There's liability at, at play. When, when you regulate something like cannabis, you have to consider it like tobacco or like alcohol. There's, there are responsibilities attached from a product liability standpoint. You've got to be able to say that this product is safe within the law, that this product is within these boundaries, that there's no pesticides in there, that there's nothing else in there that's, that's you know, not labeled that is going to cause you harm. That there's no, there's no residual metals or other, uh, you know, ingredients in, in, in nutrients left behind. And that these cannabis growers, they're going to have to be responsible, both in the way that they grow the cannabis, so that it's not accessed by people who shouldn't have access to it, mainly children, kids, teens. They're all going to seek it out. You, you can't just leave the booze on the back porch and expect that some kids from the neighborhood aren't going to pick it up. you got to put it in a liquor cabinet and lock it up, don't you? That's what you do as a responsible person with alcohol at home. You lock it up in the liquor cabinet. You keep track of it. You mark the bottle so you can see how much has been taken out. So if kids come by, yours or otherwise, and, and snork some away, uh, you've got record of it. You've got evidence of it. Same thing goes with cannabis. Again, I draw back to the idea that this is all common sense stuff. This is not some psycho mumbo jumbo I pulled out of my ass. This is just common sense. And when you put it into practical reality, it works. The reason government is so dysfunctional over this is because of the money that's tied to its prohibition. I mean, they become intoxicated with this funding source. Uh, that's not called taxes. And, and it's caused growth in sectors of both the government and the private sector uh, that they don't want to give up. Even though it's bad for society on every angle. It's bad for our economy. It's bad for taxpayer use of money. It's bad for everybody. When you take control of these issues and be responsible about them as a social unit, as a unit of government, and you regulate these things, and, and you give, you have some tolerance, you have some play where the least impact is capable of happening on society, and you take common sense approaches to these issues, you end up with a much happier society, you end up with a much uh, wealthier tax base because it's not being spent, uh, thrown down a well. Both uh, Look, there's two horrible places where money goes when you prohibit something. It goes to out of the country where it's not prohibited or where people are willing to, to, to divert the law or skirt the law, avoid the law, they're going to take that money. It's, so that, that money goes out of the country, and guess what happens? It never comes back. All the money being spent on all the illicit drugs in this country to the tune of billions of dollars a year go to Mexico and Afghanistan and Canada and every place else where they can get their grubby little hands on the demand for U.S. drugs. That money never comes back. It's no longer participating in our economy. It's now in some other countries, isn't it? It's not accounted for. It's hidden. It's laundered. And it's used in those other countries in, in, in horrible ways in many cases. I mean, look at, you know, Chapo. Guzman. I mean, here's a guy who's managed to escape federal prison in Mexico on several occasions. Uh, through dirty channels, through his own fascination with the money that the drug launder, the drugs bring in. And he's got a lot of paid people, both uh, as workers and as, as, as paid off government employees who tip him off when police get near. And, and if you, ever, you do manage to catch him, don't extradite me to the U.S. <laughs> where I'll never see the light of day again. Put me in another Mexican prison where I can pay somebody to turn their head as we tunnel our way out. And then you can play cat and mouse with me again because I so love that tacit affair. This is what happens. You create people 
uh, like this guy Noriega we had to go after in 92 and break all kinds of treaties. And, you know, I mean, these were acts of war we did in the Bush administration going and taking out a national leader over U.S. drug policy. Emmanuel Noriega. I'm not saying this guy's a good guy. I'm saying what we did was horribly illegal, but we've locked him up in a federal prison. He's now there in Miami, has been since the mid-90s. A lot of, he's life with no in prison. He's, he's under U.S. drug law, a drug kingpin. Not getting out. No chance for parole. He's going to die there, a very bitter and poor man with hardly any money in his commissary account. And, and like I say, these are the kinds of people you create when you do prohibition. This is the kind of activity you can expect. Heads will roll. Blood will spill. Most of it won't be in this country. A lot of it will. Do you want that to be your kid? Drugged, in, you know, drugged down that hole? Literally? It could happen. Gang activity is rampant across the country. And the government is, is you know, not, you know, blind to this fact at all. Gang activity is one of the principal subversions of city and state government. I mean, these are people who, if you were looking at them in tactical terms from a warfare standpoint, are insurgents. They've gone in and taken control where government has failed to do so. Where you've left a hole for people to fill, they've come in and taken control of the turf. Street by street, area block by block. You connect the dots, and pretty soon you've got South Detroit or East L.A. Or you've got these, you know, South Chicago, places in Brooklyn. I'm just saying that this is, this is what you can get and will get with the prohibition standpoint. But the government is so twisted about this. And there's a blockade at every corner to make any amends or changes. The moment you try and actually get through some sense to legislators, as was evidenced in Michigan uh, just this past season, uh, where you actually get some progress. They've all agreed to do this. Let's do it. Everybody's on point. We all agree. Let's just get it done. And then the police come along and say, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Look, that's our money. That's our, that's the only, this is the only way we can beat up. This is our jobs. This is what we do. Don't take that from us. It's the easiest way we can get to criminals. Oh, we gotta, we gotta have the pop money and all the trappings that come with it. Booey, I say, you can do without. You're getting the full melt. Young students are our future. They're eager to learn. Eager to succeed. Eager to make the world a better place. And they want to make it to school safely. Share the road. Take care when passing. And always leave three feet between you and people on bikes. Bikes are legal road vehicles. We're all drivers. Imagine a world where patients can use marijuana like any other medicine. The Marijuana Patients Organization challenges the status quo by helping our neighbors to enjoy a better quality of life. Visit the MPO at MarijuanaPatients.org and enjoy informative articles, engaging debates, and information about treatments, doctors, and dispensaries in your area. Over 50,000 people have registered at MarijuanaPatients.org since 2010. Join us at the Marijuana Patients Organization today, MarijuanaPatients.org. Hey, it's Steve Green for the Sweet Leaf in Flint, because now getting safe access to medical cannabis patients in Flint, Michigan, is never more welcoming. Presenting the Sweet Leaf, a brand new patient experience bringing 12 carefully selected caregivers housed in nine separate offices to distinctly assist you with their knowledge and reputation for excellent patient care. Classes and training coming soon in the large community room. Check it out in person, 400 South Door Highway, or call 810 259 The Sweet Leaf Center in Flint, 810-259-2571. If you're like us, your pets aren't just animals. They're members of your family. Pet Pain CBD Hemp Oil Drops are great for aging as well as active dogs and cats. Some people are apprehensive about hemp treatments for pets. They ask us, what are you smoking? (laughs) Absolutely nothing, and neither will your pet. Like other hemp-based products for humans, the Allure is all of the benefits of cannabis without any of the high. The CBD oil has shown to rejuvenate the bones, joints, brain, stomach, eyes, and heart. 
and the drops contain absolutely no corn, wheat, soy, artificial colors and flavors, or preservatives. Pick some up today. Visit PetPain.com or ask for Pet Pain at your local pet store. PetPain.com. CBD relief for your pet. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn to more about no smell technology. What's up with these things, Victor? It's the full radio things, show. We decided radio. to give ourselves stickers. We read about 10,000 suggestions. We read features that are oh, No, something want. happened, didn't it? Thousand suggestions. We read some of those. For all the confidence you need. You're fired, I'd say. You're fired, Mr. Producer. There's something strange there. No idea where that came from. But I'm the producer. I can't fire myself. Okay, I, I can fire myself. I'm fired. Okay, we're done. Okay, we're not done. It was a temporary firing. It's against my religion to fire myself. I can't do it. I have a, I have a better conscience than that. Uh, so, listen, um, one of the more interesting things I saw in the news today was uh, this business about Cannabis taxation. The cannabis t- today reporting that Colorado marijuana tax is back in the spotlight for 2015 or a statewide vote. Why? Well, uh, see, uh, it bugs me. It bugs me when people do this uh, petition drive thing and they do it in an off presidential year. I mean, the people in in in, in uh, Ohio did it. The responsible Ohio backers. See, they got the money to go out and gather the signatures. Just pay people outright per signature. Every signature you get, we give you two bucks. I mean, that's how they got this on the ballot there. Um, in, in places like this, uh, the, the coalition behind these efforts, especially from a citizen standpoint, not from a corporate standpoint, um, have much less money available to them. I mean, it's just whatever they can raise amongst their own little coalition of friends and family and supporters. It's really much more grassroots, isn't it? You know, have some big corporation giving a big, you know, donor gift. Some, you know, here, we'll just fund your campaign. Here you go. How much do you need? How much? Uh, you're short by this much? There you go. Here, here's a check. There's some of that that happens, but not, you know, it's, it's, it's lobbied for. <laughs> it's fought over. And there are 50 states and only a few organizations um, that are capable of, you know, putting forth this kind of cash. Most, mostly wealthy philanthropists who want to see a change in, you know, Peter Lewis was one of them. Um, a whole bunch of guys. Um. And some people are really good and successful at lobbying uh, people who are not connected to the cannabis community, who are lobbying business to get involved in this, to get things done, too. Those people have stayed on the sidelines, just kind of waiting to fill the vacuum left by the change that happens with these petition drives. So here's what's going on in Colorado. The ballot question prompted by Tabor asks Colorado voters, how the state should handle the $66.1 million in marijuana taxes. Should you spend it or refund it? Uh, this originally posted in the Denver Post. The only statewide ballot question on the 2015 election in Colorado offers a clear choice on how to handle $66.1 million in marijuana taxes collected in the first year of legal pot. Should lawmakers have permission to spend the money on school construction and other programs, or should the state refund the money, giving most of it back to the recreational pot growers and users? The measure's author hopes it's an easy choice. Earlier this month, State Senator Pat Stedman, a Democrat from Denver, launched a low-profile campaign to gather support ahead of the November vote On Proposition BB, Stedman designated the language to push voters in a particular direction, working from the foundation that voters twice approved measures in recent years to tax recreational marijuana, starting with the 2012 initiative to legalize pot. I sort of wrote it assuming there wouldn't be much of a campaign, so it needed to sell itself with surface appeal and have popular elements in it, like the school construction money, Stedman said in an interview. 
The vote yes on Prop BB campaign acknowledges that the marijuana question is complicated by its intersection with the taxpayer's Bill of Rights, one of the state's most polarizing topics. If the measure fails, 62% of the refund will go to pot users and growers and the rest to Colorado taxpayers, ranging from 6 to $16 based on income levels. Table requires the state to tell voters how much revenue the new tax will collect and how much total revenue the state will receive in the first year. If actual collections miss either target, a refund is necessary, unless voters say the state can keep it. The misstep triggers two Tabor mandates, a refund of all the pot tax money collected and the elimination of that tax. In addition to asking voters to forego a refund and allow the state to spend it, lawmakers approved legislation to eliminate the state marijuana sales tax for one day to meet the Tabor rule. The state tax holiday on recreational marijuana is scheduled for Wednesday, but the 15% excise tax and 10% sales tax resumes Thursday. So far, the ballot measure is facing no organized opposition. Stedman, who is working with political firm RBI Strategies and research on the campaign, said he doesn't expect to raise more than $10,000 to promote it. The legislation passed with bipartisan support. Only 23 lawmakers, all Republicans, opposed it. I think the reason you saw so much consensus is because our voters have been very, very clear with us, he said, citing the 65% vote for taxation of marijuana in 2013. The Cannabis Chamber of Commerce supported the legislature, uh, the legislation rather, but it does not plan on putting money towards the Proposition BB campaign. I don't know if really anyone needs to put up any money, said Tyler Henson, the chamber's president. I think the people are going to read it and see the value of where the money is going to go, and I don't think we're going to see too many people oppose it. Most vocal opposition is Douglas Bruce, the author of Tabor, the disgraced former state lawmaker who is once again facing the prospect of jail time, suggests that the $66.1 million request to spend money represents a tax increase, and the ballot question is plagued with issues that make it unconstitutional. He's threatening to file a lawsuit to challenge the measure, though he acknowledged he likely won't win. In a recent legislative hearing where he aired his objections, Bruce took particular aim at how the measure says the money will be spent if it passes. I think it's wrong for you to provide a teaser or an inducement for people to vote yes when you're trying to supposedly be objective and factual, he said, complaining that some people of the, some of the programs that stand to benefit, quote, have nothing to do with marijuana, end quote. House GOP leader Brian Del Grasso also noted that the legislature is not required to spend the money, as the ballot measure suggests, and asks whether it's kind of a shell game to increase state spending. In rebuttal, Stedman said he sees a nexus between the programs, some of which are favorites for certain lawmakers because they help youth, quote, stay in school and away from drugs, end quote. He said the measure spends money how people intended when they approved the taxes for the first time. <clears throat> and this is a controversy that will continue especially in places like Colorado, where they had already passed legislation outlining what the state's allowed to do and not allowed to do with tax money. And in the event they collect too much, what they got to do then. I don't know that there are any other states like Colorado. I've never had a chance to investigate them, really. But I can say this for sure. If there are other states like Colorado that bring this issue forth, I, I would say that it's likely more than not to hamper future legalization questions, especially in states that have sensitivity towards the way their state taxes and spends the citizens' money. Because if you're in a state that's sensitive to that issue and you come along and say, hey, here's some brand new tax money. It's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a gimme. We're, we're going to collect, we're, you know, we're going to do this anyways, whether you take the tax money or not. So here's the money. Do you want the money? Oh, this is money and nobody cares that we're taking it. We're... We're not increasing taxes. The people are doing it. Uh, okay, we'll take the money. Uh, so then they take the money, and then you got people on the inside saying, ah, ha, ha, follow the queen, follow the queen. No, she's not there. Congratulations, you lost your tax money. Give it all back. <laughs> so in places where you're going to use that as a teaser, as you're going to use that as bait to get it done, and, you're, and your base is also sensitive to taxation money and the way that the state's going to spend those funds, you better be prepared for a mounted failure. Really? I, don't you think that opposition is going to stand in the way and, and hold up? If Colorado voters do this, if they say we're going to give all that taxation money back and we're not, we're not going to allow the, the state legislators to spend the money on these schools? Uh, it was recently uh, positioned um, in a paper that I read uh, that it's a horrible idea to tax 
and regulate marijuana, cannabis, and give it to schools. Because the schools should be number one, shouldn't they? It shouldn't be special interest money. It shouldn't be some tease, some sideline, some add-in, some addendum. It should be underlying your state's position that the children of, are the future of the country and their education is paramount upon your success in that marketplace. That's what schools should be doing is being funded by the legislators that are hired by the citizens of their, of their state to do their damn job. The Full Melt Show is a production of TFM Media.